What will be the biggest stories of the year ahead? In 2020, the global economy could tip into recession. The trade war between the US and China is one of the biggest risks to the global economy. 250 years after his birth, one of history's greatest composers becomes a global eco-warrior. Beethoven loved nature. He was writing for today and future generations. And the world's greatest sporting event comes to Tokyo, where the inclusion of trans athletes could spark controversy. Trans women are women. I think we need to race based on biology. Da 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 dum, da 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 dum. There is only one Beethoven. In 2020, music lovers' ears will be attuned to the 250th anniversary of the birth of Ludwig van Beethoven, one of the most influential and popular classical composers in history. Beethoven broke the rules of music. He did things differently. Take, for instance, his Eroica Symphony, Symphony No. 3. How does it begin? With two massive chords, it goes bang, bang. No one had done that before. It's Beethoven saying, look what I can do. I'm going to do it differently. And he did that in every form of music that he wrote in. In 2020, across the globe, orchestras will be celebrating this genius and his legacy with a string of performances and concerts. We listen to his music now and there's a tendency to think it came from him fully formed. But if you look at his many sketchbooks and manuscript pages, they're crossings out, there are obliterations, there are tears in the paper. He struggled to compose, and yet it's what he did. Written during the Age of Enlightenment, Beethoven's music has a history of being intertwined with politics. The opening motif of his fifth symphony, equivalent to the letter V in Morse code, became a symbol of resistance to the Nazis. And the final movement of his Ninth Symphony became the hymn for the European Union. He believed in the power of the ordinary human being. That was who he was writing his music for. And of course, we had the great message in the choral symphony, the final movement, Schiller's Ode to Joy, which is all mankind will be brothers. Alle Menschen werden Brüder. It's a universal message. And in 2020, his pastoral symphony will be used as an anthem to unite millions across the world to act against climate change. Beethoven loved nature. There was nothing he loved more than taking long, long walks in the country, always composing as he went, waving his arms in the air, jotting notes down. And that's why the pastoral symphony is so important in, in his output. 250 years after his birth, Beethoven will continue to set the tone for the future. He wouldn't be in the least bit surprised that his music was so relevant today. After all, he knew back then that he was writing for today and future generations. So he'd probably say, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, told you, told you. Twenty twenty will be the year nurses receive the attention and treatment they deserve. The World Health Organization has declared it will be the year of the nurse. That's excellent. Almost half of healthcare workers globally are nurses, and they are increasingly taking on a growing number of tasks previously reserved for doctors. Most people have no idea what modern nursing entails. They think of them as the sidekicks of heroic doctors. It's hard the way we have to rely upon these amateur nurses. Nursing today is a highly skilled profession. Many nurses have university degrees. There are even doctorate level studies in nursing. In America, two thirds of anesthetics are administered by nurses. And nurses in some sub Saharan countries even carry out emergency caesareans. It's definitely a new level of autonomy. Nurses in Britain are now trained to perform surgery and are taking on more responsibility for patients in life and death situations. 
With this role, it's going down to see patients on the ward, often by yourself, attending cardiac arrest calls, um, and going to see sort of the, some of the sickest patients in the hospitals. 2020 will also mark 200 years since the birth of perhaps the most famous nurse in history, Florence Nightingale. If she were around today, she would probably be concerned that a global shortage of nurses will be the biggest problem facing national health systems in the coming decade. By 2030, the world will be short of 7.6 million nurses. Countries will have to do more to recruit and educate new nurses locally, as well as to retain those that are already in place. Rich countries cannot continue to lure nurses from poor countries, where health systems are already severely crippled by the shortage of nurses. Singapore has led the way in addressing nurse shortages. For the moments we were saying, it has successfully increased applications from young people to nursing school by commissioning dramas, documentaries, and even a catchy pop song. Looking into the future, nurses will be even more important because so you have more people living longer, they require more care. A lot of healthcare professionals, at least partially, may be replaced by AI. With nursing, that would be very difficult because at its heart, nursing, its healing powers are about empathy and a human touch. The games of the 32nd Olympiad are awarded to the city of Tokyo. Yeah! In July 2020, Billions of people will watch the Olympic flame burn once again as the Tokyo Olympics begin. But with new rules making it easier for transgender women to compete in women's events for the first time, 2020 could turn out to be a highly controversial Olympic Games. There's a heated debate in women's sports over the inclusion of transgender women, people who are biologically male and identify as women. International Olympic Committee rules currently allow transgender women to compete in women's sports, provided they have suppressed their testosterone levels for at least 12 months. You can't just ignore the fact that biology is something that, as humans, we have. But some observers, like former Olympic swimmer and medalist Sharon Davies, argue these athletes will have an unfair advantage you're not going to be able to get rid of the male puberty that they've gone through, the fact that they have male biology. So even by reducing testosterone for one year, it's still not going to level the playing field. But others take a very different view, like track cyclist Rachel McKinnon, who has become a high-profile transgender athlete since winning a world championship in 2018. Athletes come in a huge range of shapes and sizes and natural abilities. Population demographics around the world are different. So Dutch women average height is over five foot six. Indonesian women is around four foot 10. So sport is never level, if by which we mean no one has a competitive advantage over each other, because that's the point of sport. During male puberty, testosterone drives the development of bigger muscles with more fast twitching fibres, sturdier bones, and a larger heart and lungs. All lifelong advantages when it comes to speed and strength. The difference between boys' and girls' running times increases in adolescence, and the gap is even bigger for jumping events. And in 2019, among top athletes, around 2,000 men finished the 100 metres more quickly than the fastest woman. Sharon Davies believes there is a danger that transgender athletes could dominate some women's sports, and that these sports could once again be blighted by unfairness. In the 70s and the 80s, we had the East German system where female athletes were filled full of testosterone, and it made them unbeatable. So for nearly a whole generation, the East German women totally dominated in almost all female sports at, at Olympic and world level. But there were many British that came 
fourth and fifth and sixth and no one's ever heard of them because they didn't pick up a medal, which they should have done. So I feel quite passionately that I just don't want to see that happen to a whole generation of female athletes again. Davies and others who have voiced their concerns have faced strong criticism from the transgender community and beyond. You have been called uh, by the transgender cyclist Rachel McKinnon a transphobe and somebody who shares hate speech. McKinnon argues the debate is fundamentally about equality and human rights, both on and off the playing field. Inclusion is a fundamental principle in society. So I think that applies also to sport, that applies to intersex women, cis women, and trans women, that to be considered fully equal members of society, to be respected in our identities, is to be included in sport for who we are. And trans women are women. The IOC says it actively supports both inclusion and fairness. It was due to announce stricter guidelines for transgender athletes in September 2019. But so far, its panel of scientists have failed to agree on what these should be. I think we need to race based on biology. So I think the very simple, straightforward way to race is based on your chromosomes. And if you carry a Y chromosome, which gives you a uh, benefit, a Y benefit, a male benefit to your strength levels um, and your testosterone levels, then you need to race where it's apparent. So we would, should have an XX female category protected and an open category, which is then inclusive for absolutely everybody that wants to be able to compete. So I just think there's ways forward that doesn't mean the destruction of female sport. While countries will be competing to make their mark on the medal tables, the 2020 Olympics could also prove to be a decisive moment in the wider global debate about gender identity. In 2020, the possibility of recession will once again hang over the world economy, thanks to one thing in particular. The trade war between the US and China is one of the biggest risks to the global economy, and it could be enough to tip it into a recession. The US increased tariffs on $200 billion worth of goods. China striking back at the US today, saying it will raise tariffs on $60 billion of US goods. We saw an escalation in the trade war between the US and China at the start of 2019. And after months of confrontation, China and America agreed a preliminary deal at the end of 2019. To me, not complicated, but that's what I do. It's a phenomenal deal. But details are scant, and there's likely to be more back and forth in 2020. We still don't know how that's going to play out. Business confidence is low, and there's been a synchronized slowing over the course of 2019 around the world. Everyone loses in a trade war. And in 2020, one of the biggest losers set to be caught in the crossfire will be Germany. Germany is the motor of the European economy and it's really been sputtering for the past year. In the third quarter of 2019, it very narrowly avoided falling into a recession. Germany is very exposed to international trade and as a result, it's particularly vulnerable to an intensification of the trade war in 2020. Germany relies more heavily on trade than any other major economy. Its exports are worth almost half of its GDP and much of that is manufacturing exports. Kion, a global company based in Frankfurt, is the second largest producer of forklifts in the world. American tariffs on Chinese exports have affected the company's sales, and the continued uncertainty is damaging the company's ability to plan for 2020 and beyond. Today you have a tariff, tomorrow maybe not. Where should you make your next investment? And so if you're not sure of how competitive is this region going to be, what do you do? You wait. Or you do it someplace else. In 2020, the chilling effects of the trade war could spread further than manufacturing. The fear is that an intensification of the trade war and a potentially disorderly Brexit could mean that the troubles will spread from the manufacturing sector in Germany to the rest of the economy, which so far has been insulated from the pain. If a recession looms in Germany, the government may have to change its traditional habits. Germany has a chronic underinvestment problem. The government has a rule which means that it cannot run um, a budget deficit. In 2020, if the economy continues to do badly and unemployment starts to rise, the government might find itself forced to break the rule and to spend more to stimulate the economy. 
And if the malaise spreads globally, other governments may also need to loosen the purse strings. The biggest story of 2020 will be President Trump's bid to be re-elected as the leader of the free world. We're going to keep making America great again. Mr. Trump's re-election hopes depend on him winning in the states he took from the Democrats in 2016. He will probably take Ohio and Iowa again, and possibly Florida too. But Michigan and Pennsylvania may return to the Democrats. And this means that one small state in the Midwest could be the most fiercely contested, Wisconsin. If Donald Trump wins Wisconsin again in 2020, it's highly likely that he'll end up back in the White House for four years. The reason Wisconsin is so competitive is in many ways it's a microcosm of the country. And like in other states, the big cities, Milwaukee, heavily democratic, as you move further out into the outer suburbs, they get more Republican until you get into the countryside when you're into solidly Republican territory. Since 1984, Wisconsin has voted Democrat in every presidential election until 2016. Donald Trump will carry the state of Wisconsin. This is truly the beginning of the end for Hillary Clinton's <laughs> campaign. In 2016, Donald Trump won the state by a narrow margin of just 22,748 votes. I won Wisconsin, and I like Wisconsin a lot. Hillary Clinton famously didn't campaign in Wisconsin in 2016. The Democratic nominee will not be making the same mistake this time around. In 2020, Democratic candidates will ramp up their well-rehearsed attacks on Mr. Trump. His policies. We have a guy there that is literally running our country like a game show. His personality. In this president, you have somebody who is a racist. And his failures. The president felt free to break the law again and again and again. But baiting the president and his record is unlikely to be the key to setting up a democratic victory in the Badger State. That will probably hinge on something else, voter turnout. On the election night itself, the thing to watch for will be whether turnout in downtown Milwaukee is high, which would help Democrats, or whether it's high in the rural areas and the outer suburbs, which are predominantly Republican. Who wins the presidency will affect billions around the world, but that outcome may depend on who turns up to the polls in a state of just six million people. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to read more of our predictions and analysis of the big stories for 2020, click the link opposite. And if you'd like to see how well we did last year, predicting the big stories of 2019, click on the other link. And don't forget to subscribe.